So, you know what's interesting? Um, I would have, ch- well, spoken to probably half a dozen different people over the last few days. And um, they're saying, oh, who are you chatting to? And I run through the list and they, I bring up your name and they go, yeah, right. He'll be an interesting fella. He's, <laughs> he's having a fair crack. And um, I think, yeah, Tom, what would be interesting is I've only seen probably a, a tiny part of your grain operation here and what's going on. But more broadly, what have you guys got going on here at home? Oh, there's, we run a pretty intensive cropping operation. So we're pretty heavy in double cropping pretty regularly with, with the right rainfall, plenty of nutrition. So farming about 12,000 hectares consistently. Um, we're fence to fence this year. So that made harvest a very long one. Yeah. Um, we pretty much do most things ourselves here. We mix all our own concrete for all our own development work. The only thing that we really buy in is our like molasses and cotton seed for the feedlot, whereas most other things are all done in house. So that keeps that's a fair fair job in itself. So like all our like put silos in, we'll do all the concreting and everything to save, do our own earthworks, build our own dams, do all our design work on laser leveling. Um, we've got a feedlot as well. It's licensed out to twenty thousand head. It's what five thousand sheep units in that twenty thousand, and then nine and a half thousand cattle. It's built to ten thousand head. Um, we've just got a regional development grant as well in the last twelve months, so we're expanding our sheep operation feedlots. So we've gone from one shed to three sheds with a full blown handling facility and loadout facility. So that's pretty cool as well. Um, we run our six to eight hundred breeder cows, depending on the season. Um, use we run three and a half thousand and they're on a double joining cycle as well. So there's pretty much work 365, no matter where you look. I can imagine. And just for those listening who aren't familiar with Coggan Farms, whereabouts in Queensland are you? Oh, uh, we're about five hours west of Brisbane. Um, our closest major centre would be Gundawindi. Tara's kind of close, but I would, it's not as, it's probably not big enough to have machinery dealerships and everything. So we do a fair bit of business through Gundawindi, Dolby and Toowoomba. That's kind of our heartland of where we do everything with. Um, St. George we do a bit with as well, but majority is we're going east for food or time away or anything. So it's quite normal to be where you do, you do your business, where you're traveling. So yeah. Um, What's the area like around here, M- mainly cattle or is it a fair bit of farming? Oh, in our direct vicinity, in it, like Ingleston's probably our closest area. Like there's a local golf course and a local area there. It's pretty heavily cropping. Yep. Um, probably when you go from here to Mooney would be, there's cattle grazing in the middle, but I'd say pretty heavily cropping. Like return return on hectare pretty reasonable we've had we're pretty reliable with rainfall like we've had like we got hit pretty hard with the drought in 2019 but pretty like reliable when, when you guys say that like what would what would it be in, in say a 10 year cycle how many years are you going to get your cropping program we've in? planted a crop every year well that well I've, when I'm talking to dad he's never missed a planting yep. like we've always planted something and always got a result so there's like that's that's good we're not we're not west where you miss five and get 10 or miss three and get three. Mm-hmm. It's yeah, we're pretty consistent. Just got to take the opportunity when the good one comes like last year. Yeah. I was going to say, like, what do you reckon the key to successful farming is out here? I think just taking the opportunities when they come. Yeah. Like I think if you were on a fixed rotation, you could mix, miss an opportunity. Like in 2015, 16, we planted chickpeas on chickpeas three years in a row and it paid dividends with because we were able to grow our chickpeas, sell them out and buy wheat back in for the feedlot and we were three times the price on exit with chickpeas versus wheat. So, like, I feel like just taking a slightly different step and trying to – we're farm, grain farmers at heart, but we are essentially grain farmers. Like, we do whatever the rain does, so we have to be prepared that if it – we have a late – we have a fallow period and we get rain and you don't want to plant and you've missed the planting window and rain comes, you need to be able to adapt to move that in. So we've got a grain dryer on site. Mm -hmm. So we're probably on the later window of sorghum planting now, but because we had weed issues, we've had a heap of rain without 
the ability of, if, since we've got our drain, grain dryer, we've got that ability to fall back on. We can plant the air and guarantee we're going to still be able to deliver on quality moisture, inspect grain and land the high price. Yep. So that gives us a pretty good opportunity there. My God. I'm, what's running through my head is like, so if you were to look at, at the business and, and maybe, yeah, just f- for context, who's involved, who are the key decision makers and what does the management team look like? Oh, well, it's a fifth generation farm. So we've been here since 37. Um, my grandfather and grandma have stepped away from the business. He had a pretty major heart operation in 05 to 07, Mm -hmm. like he's kind of in and out. Um, and then he came back full time in, uh, at the end of 07. So he's been probably not as heavy involved as what he was. Um, and then through to 2016, he had another life threatening, um, occurrence with health. Um, and it's been really good to still have my grandfather around, but he's taken a pretty big step back now. He still, he still would be here every day of the week if his health allowed it. And, um, my grandma allowed it. She likes being retired, but he's bored, he reckons. But yeah, so he's stepped out, they've stepped out of the business in the last two years. Um, and mum and dad are full ownership of everything now. Mm-hmm. But like there's still a few things that have got to sort out, but that's the same with any fam- farming family. It's not just, we're not just a unique picture. Everyone's the same. Yeah. Um, so mum and dad are the boss. I'm probably under them. They uh, give me pretty good leeway on whatever endeavour I want to do with in the business. I'm not, I'm not forced to drive a tractor for 24 hours a day and just sit on a tractor. Dad and mum have made a pretty big heavy role to make sure that I'm across everything in our business that that way, if something would ever happen, I'm across it. But also if I've got those skills, it means that if I'm ever somewhere at a mate's place or at a field day or whatever, if there's an opportunity to see something that could improve efficiency, I've, I've, I'm across everything to know, to be able to take that step, not just sitting there going, oh, well, how would that work if I knew nothing about our cattle? I know I'm yeah. enough to know about it, if that makes sense. Mate, that's very forward thinking because it, it is as knowing that you're probably the most mobile of anyone in the business. Yeah. That that thinking of going, yeah, how do you, how do you get that 1% gain, 5% yeah. gain, whatever it might be. Like when I was in high, high school, it was pretty like, I just wanted to be on the header at harvest and just drive the header. But now this year I probably work on the logistics side of organizing trucks and saving money on freight and working to make sure allocating it into our storages to make sure we get our, um, proteins right and our moistures right, because that's all that where the, all the little one percenters are. So I'd probably say I'm probably chasing the 1% of gains rather than being in the tractor, just going backwards and forwards. Do you miss sitting in the tractors and headers and things? Oh, it's pretty nice sometimes. <laughs> um, I think, I think I have an appreciation of everyone who drives them for us. Like we've got a very good crew. Um, they're very accommodating to like, to, um, like they're very good with when I give them direction and, and understand that I don't have to be like, I can't, I'm not in the machine all the time. So, but. I'd like to say with supporting all our staff, I am across pretty much everything that we do. So I'm only a phone call away. I can pretty much off the cuff tell you what I've got to do to fix it. So would you say you're probably the the most active in terms of engaging with everyone across the business? Oh, I think one thing that my parents have done very well is they've allowed us all to run our own sections, but also be quite fluid between each other's sections as well. So maybe on the communication standpoint, I'm probably really active, Mm -hmm. but then there's other areas that mum really excels in. And then there's other areas that dad really excels in. So I think the, from a diversity standpoint, it's very important that we're all across everything, but we've got key skills that we're probably each one of us individually are better at. And, and what do you reckon like on that as, as in, I know they've got you across Everything. Everything in the business, as you say, but then also going, well, actually, let's play to your strengths and, and develop where we can, what needs to be developed, but actually also go, what's going to be best for, for the business? Yeah. Well, I probably think one of my strengths is probably being, a, I'm a pretty heavy communicator with our staff, whether they're older, younger. Um, so being a communicator is pretty important, especially with the number of staff we run. So like the wage bill can step up pretty high with inefficiencies if you're not across it all and making sure your goals are getting hit and everyone's rocking up to work on time and keeping everything rolling. Dad is a very cool head, very understanding of 
when things break, he can fix anything. He's very good at like if something goes wrong, he always just he keeps the situation very calm, doesn't allow things to be said between people or anything. Like if someone hits a fence post or something, it's very cool head. It's not a problem. We can get through it. It's better than anyone being hurt sort of mindset. Um, I think dad is a very good farmer. He's very talented at what he does. Like he's picking off opportunities and stuff is pretty, um, if I can do what he can do, I'll be pretty proud. Yeah. Um, mum's a very good communicator. So she's really good in our, like the HR of our business and keeping the wheels on the whole show with everything, like paying the bills and questioning things and making sure that if dad goes, oh, I want a new tractor or I want a new header, he'll make, sh- he'll challenge dad to, ma- mum will challenge dad to make sure like he jumps through all the hoops and ticks all the boxes to make sure it's not just a, like make sure it's a sensible business choice, not just a choice because you want it, you know? Yeah, right. That'll, I'm sure there'll be some interesting conversations around the table. Yeah, I think it's quite healthy though. I think, um, yeah. I think one thing that maybe it has evolved with the business is that um, since I've kind of stepped into the fold and mum and dad have gone out on their own, I think they've very much allowed us to facilitate being really good as an individual but also making sure it, we're all striving in the right direction and having a disagreement is not a bad thing. Mm-hmm. Like mum always says, it diverse, lucky we're all diverse and different because if there was three Toms in the business, it probably wouldn't work. Totally. I think what's interesting, um, I would say your old man's cool head. So it was only a very simple example, but go around the corner before truck driving along with brakes on because yeah. of a malfunction within the truck. But so interesting where I'd say, and especially younger people, like, yeah, three tractors moving, trucks going left, right and centre and something like that happens. Others could really jump quite quickly to a, what's going on here? Yeah. Um, whereas for you, it was like, oh, what's worth kind of yeah. working Yeah. Well, I think, I think people is a very big asset. It's probably maybe in years gone by, probably not as a big as important role. But now with wages going up, the good people are harder to find. You've got to look after the ones you got and at the end of the day, we all make mistakes where just because you own the farm doesn't mean that you're not going to make a mistake. Like, yeah, you own the gear. If you heard it, it's your fault. But I think having pride in what you do, if you, if you as an owner have pride in what you do and don't get angry at them, then they might go that extra mile for you or they might be a bit more accommodating for you that if you're, you're on the weekend and suddenly the cattle are out of water and you're away five hours away, they'll probably help you. So that's like today in that situation, Stephen, one of our guys, a really good guy. And if I'd probably gone and stomped on him, then it, I probably could, yeah, be a bad situation. But he's probably going to go, he'll probably drive the planter for us tonight because we've got rain coming. So it, it's give and take. Where do you reckon you've learned that, like, I'll say that management and leadership style from? No, I think a bit on the job and also just, I feel like I've been like that probably growing up from my different experiences from going to boarding school and learning to respect the older guys above us in boarding, but also knowing when you're in within your role to do that, going to uni, interacting with a heap of different people. I found uh, my job at UQ was very good for like recapping and reevaluating and stuff because every time you went out on a shift, we spoke at schools and then you had a review in the car ride home with your partner and talked about what worked well, what didn't work well. So I was in a classroom environment pretty regularly in uni. Tell me more about that. What? So I was a UQ ambassador. So what we did was we um, went to schools and just spoke about unis and goal setting. Um, we probably weren't a hard, we weren't the hardcore like selling uni. We were more setting yourself up for future, whether that is a tertiary education or a pre- uh, like a traineeship or whichever direction you want to go. Um, so that was quite cool to be in that environment and justifying it's okay not to go to uni, but also talking about the benefits of it. Mm. So I feel like that role was really key with some of the things I've learned just in reflection and things like that, because it's, I don't, there was, I've never had another job like that or never been in another environment where you present have a heap of like you're interacting with 30 40 kids in a classroom 
and then you reflect on that 20 minutes straight after the session. Mm. So. I mean, was that just something that was, was I'll say, part of the, the training, like part of the culture that was created? Yeah, that um, was the culture at UQ, yeah. That's so, really interesting. Yeah, so that that job I only stumbled across because my older sister had done it. Yep. And then they they were they don't their staff turnover is quite low, and like of course people graduate that's where the turnover happens. But there had been a fair few members that hadn't gone anywhere, and there was only an intake of eight. Yeah. So I was lucky enough to receive the job. Um, it paid quite well for uni as well. Um, but yeah, it was Always great. Helpful. And you could like roster on, so it worked quite well because you came out and you had a month roster. You could roster for five shifts a week, one whatever. So coming home to work on holidays and stuff, I didn't lose my part-time job in uni. I could just go, I'm going home for three weeks. Don't worry, I'm going to, I'll come back, but I'm just not there right now. So it was a really good casual job with that mindset of that. And, and I think also with the skills, just watching and just, I probably would say I'm not a pushy person by nature. I'm very like, would like to be observant and always ask questions. Like when I was little, I always just wanted to question things and understand them. Didn't want to just go, well, that's how it's done. That's how it's got to be. Very happy to adapt and yeah. So, well, I'll make, my assumption would, would be like looking at you now, you're so passionate about the farm. Did you find it hard to be removed from it while you're at, at uni or did you actually enjoy kind of that, that I gap? had, I feel like I was facilitated quite well with mum and dad and my peer group at uni and everything. Um, like the farming's been a very big part of my background, but like at boarding school, I'd probably talk to dad every day just about the farm and how things are going. And I feel like that was very, like if I, dad hadn't been as communicative or, or excited to tell me his things, like just little things like at school, talk about buying hay bale or talk about something just on the phone. Probably I didn't feel as removed. Like it wasn't like maybe 20 years ago where there wasn't as much communication I reckon that removal would have been a lot harder, mm -hmm. but now with communication, it's so open. Like when I was studying for my master's, I was away for three weeks and we were pretty busy here, but I was able to still, in, and still work. Tell me a little bit. So studied obviously at UQ undergrad, then this thing, which is a thing of the past, COVID came through. Yeah. Um, and, and a decision, further study, what will, firstly, like, so, Part of the story that I know, your old man dropped out in, in year 10, but you were, you've really, I guess, been supported to continue it, your education yeah. pathways. I think it, it, dad did year 10 and then he did a ag college um, for two years. So he was 18 when he came home and he was not against study. He was not for study. He was just very neutral and it was whatever, whatever I wanted to do. And mum's, mum's side is she's an ex-nurse. Um, She's a triple nurse, so she's quite qualified at that. Um, and I think having a parent that's done a parent that's done each type, each pathway was quite good too. Um, we always just spoke about it growing up that it was either like whatever you wanted to do, as long as your pathway was happy, mm -hmm. but just making sure that whatever you did, you threw a hundred percent into it. So that's probably the mindset to go to uni. I kind of got to. We started, when we had to pick our senior subjects, I started picking some courses, like I did ag, ag science and economics, accounting, and I um, felt like getting that extra level of learning in was going to be quite crucial with trying to drive a business rather than just, I didn't want to just come home and just work within the business and just be a piece of the puzzle. I wanted to make sure I was able, hopefully, able to be the one putting the puzzle together, not being a piece. Yeah. If that makes sense. So going to uni, I went to, did ag agribusiness. I didn't actually really know where it was going to go or how it was going to go. I just knew that it felt right at the time. Like I can't give anyone advice on how it worked. It just felt the step, it, it was feeling like a step in the right direction. And then COVID kind of was a blessing, but also kind of a cruel time as well. So like I was just moved out of college and moved into a share house. It was really fun. We had about three weeks of really good times, just had our big house party and everything. And then COVID hit. And then what well, we had cases everywhere, it was locked down. And then I came home, worked very heavily in the business. Mum and dad let me integrate in very well, quite, quite hands-on. 
I was quite fortunate that I'd done two exchanges before COVID. So I'd had subjects up my sleeve. So I didn't have to, I only did three subjects a semester, not four. So I had a bit more time um, and really cut my teeth, not just in the management side of things, but also just in the operations. And I just, the burning desire to continue to learn was there. And like I said earlier in the paddock about had some very good people that we use, consultants and Ag- agronomists and everyone around um, and they just spoke about their studies and I was like, well, it'd be pretty cool to do something on that. Um, our sheep business we built from the ground up. We had heaps of merinos years and years and years and years and years ago. Um, we bought back into meat sheep in 2011 from our harvest money that we got in a late harvest, us three kids. So we kind of built that whole business up from scratch with mum and dad's support. Um, so I kind of was a part of that journey from, from, from joining. It's not like the big farming business has been around for years and years. So I haven't actually probably, I've jumped on the end of it where the cream is not at the very start where you're the one doing the work on a Saturday or the one before holidays or something. So that's what we did with the sheep business. So that kind of kept us quite grounded and having that experience of seeing the business grow, my, that's where my master's thesis came from because it was an economic thing. We were allowed to send entire sheep to the abattoir Mm -hmm. that got cut off because of market dynamics and everything. So then that's when the study kind of came from because that economic effect started changing how we did things. And I wanted to really dial into why that was. And, um, so yeah, did a full blown study on it that was ran for a hundred days at home and wrote a what's 80 page report on it. So, um, I'm interested. Was the, was the sheep the passion or it was more the sheep or a business unit and you wanted to understand the economics and how? I think the all together. Yeah, okay. Like I wouldn't call myself a sheep farmer. I wouldn't call myself a cattle farmer. I wouldn't call myself a grain farmer. I'd like to say I'm a mixed business person. Yep. So I feel like the number the numbers behind the business probably drive me more than the physical task. Like, yeah, I love driving a header. Yeah, I love driving a planner, but I'm not just doing it in vain. I want to know that if we plant this sorghum crop, we plant this wheat crop, what's going to actually be the gain out of it? We're not just running through the motions till we're 40. Yeah. So let, let's talk about maybe some of the, the grain side of the business. What I want to ask you first, I found this really interesting um, one, well, yeah, I probably would have thought you'd be a John Deere person. You're not tied to a colour of a machine? No. I'd say we probably <laughs> were green-blooded for a lot of years there. It's just hard with distance. like. We've got these two Canadians who are working for us and they talk about their headers breaking down in harvest and they just lift them out of the field, drive 20 minutes down and they're in the dealership. Yeah. So it's very easy to be loyal to that customer base. Whereas it's hard because the dealerships also have staff turnover and we're not under no illusions of that. And it's sometimes, sometimes that happens. It's not their fault. We have it too. So the loyalty of the colors has probably changed. Um, they're all, they all have the advantages and disadvantages of what they've got. Um, it's just at the time we're pretty heavy. We've got, we're pretty heavy with fence. We've got fence headers, fence tractors, we've still got a, and versatile tractors, John Deere tractors. Now we've even gone case Patriots as well. So we've got a fair, I think we've nearly got every brand under the sun here, but. And keeping Green Star consistent across them all. Yeah. <laughs> what were the drivers behind, I guess, so the, the planning rigs is what I saw before, but yeah. talk, talk to us. Um, yeah, I think what, where did, the decisions come from to yeah. change. Well, and let's talk about the whole, the whole units of um, what you guys are running. Well, the, the machinery side, the, the change happened was we had a few computer issues with our John Deere's like hands down for compatibility and all of the comfort and all those John Deere's are really, really good. I think the fence might pit them in comfort now that we've got <laughs> the new fence here, but, um, I think just the driver of them and just tr- changing because we weren't quite happy with what we had. Like the John Deere's, there's nothing wrong with them. Mechanically, they were really good, but we just had some sensor issues where you'd be planning and you'd want to go 8K, but they're derating to 6. So there's 2Ks and now you're losing. Mm. And it's that's not the dealership's fault. Like we loved the dealerships. They were doing a really good job, but we just couldn't. The efficiencies weren't there. Yeah. Oh, and, and to fix that redundancy, it's one sensor. You want to get a mechanic out, bang, there's $1,000, $1,500 just to get him here to look at it. And then if he doesn't get the right part, 
the bills just add up and up and up and up and up. So that's when we jumped to Versatile just because they're a simpler machine. Um, they've been quite good, um, but with the Versatile situation in Australia, they're not really importing them at the moment because of that whole dynamic going on there. So we had to start looking elsewhere. And that's when we've jumped to the Fent headers because you couldn't get X9s because we've always had S, we've had S680s, 90s, like all of the John Deere header brand, like headers we've had for years. But so we jumped to these Fent headers because we wanted a class nine machine that had separator capacity, not just a big rotor with more horsepower. Because like an S690 is a class nine, but or an S790, but it doesn't have the actual, you don't actually get a separator gain. It's no different to a class eight. Yep. So that's when we stepped to these fence was because that's at the time we could get them. And we put, we've gone to, we're 18 meter CTF now. We've got three 18 meter fronts and then we've got a 40 footer as well. But it's all, it was all based just on availability, timing, like an, it's not just a singular decision or it's a John Deere, I'll buy it. And you mentioned in the, in the paddock as well about like even just what seems like small things, but um, revs and, yeah. and fuel efficiency. Yeah, fuel efficiency, comfort, just, just the little things. Like I feel because I'm maybe not in the machine all the time, um, I definitely am mindful of that. I'm not going to get one of our guys who work for us or want yeah, and guys and girls. We're, we're pretty diverse. It <laughs> should be a bit more not specific but yeah guys generally yeah generally the, yeah yeah but yeah <laughs> the crew so yeah the crew <laughs> um yeah so the staff i just didn't want to if i don't want to drive it i shouldn't expect them to drive it mm -hmm. so but then i also have the expectation if i'm giving them a really good machine to drive they should look after it and to this day most machines we've got are very well looked after and things like that so the driver to make sure that if we're going to try to hit an 18 hour planning day they need to be an 18 hour planning day machine, not just cheap and nasty and yeah, just band-aiding it to get the job done. The Swarm Farm and, and Robotics, you guys were early issue adopters in the 30 something um, yeah. units of that. Literally only yesterday I saw my very first one in a paddock yeah. um, as I was driving down the road there at North Star, which was yeah, super, super interesting. And then coming pretty, out here. Pretty daunting, hey, when you haven't seen them before. Well, and it was actually at the end of the paddock turning on the roadside too. And I was like, yeah. uh, quickly pulled up reverse back and then just stopped and watched it for a bit. Yeah. Um, tell me a bit about that. You, the, the, I guess the driver behind. Yeah. Bring that so they, the robots arrival coincided with my arrival home. So sway. yeah, it was meant to be, Hey, <laughs> um, the, like dad went to a field day. I was, had exams on, so I couldn't go to this field day. We had just put an order in for a big 36 meter haze, weed it. We're like, yep, we need capacity, so we'll buy a bigger machine, um, add it to the fleet. It was about 500000 for this machine. Cost was like, it'll be what it'll be. It's a camera spray. It saves us money and will pay itself off in two years in chemical savings. So it's not a problem. Then Dad went to these, um, this, the Swarm Farm field day at Mooney, and there was someone who spoke to him and just was talking about being a slave to the paddock and buying another haze boom with a tractor. Yes, it gives you capacity, but it doesn't actually change the underlying issue, which is time in the paddock. The only way the camera sprayers work really well is by repetition of the same product, hitting it, killing it, getting it at the same time every time. Mm -hmm. So that's when we saw these robots and we went, well, they only had a 12 metre boom then. And we went, well, we could go down this avenue, but 12 metres is not going to cut the mustard. It's not going to get the job done. So then that's when Dad went to this field day. Um, Andrew could guarantee that we could go to an 18-metre bar. We put the order in for two. We, we rang up that day, cancelled the big boom, put the orders in for the – Dad had signed the orders forms before he even got home from the field day, and we'd ordered the booms, and that was in the July, and then in the December we had our first one. And how have they gone for you? I would have – if when we first got them in the first few months, I probably would have said like a five or a six. But like, I don't, I, they're maybe not at close 10 now. You've got to always leave room, but I'd say they're an eight or a nine out of 10 for us now. Like they're just, they're very good. You're seeing huge. Yes. Huge gains in ca like just this summer has been a bit hard. We've had what, 400 mil in since the end of November. So, oh no, start of November, sorry. So we've got huge weed pressure issues. We've got contours full of water. So that 
that's been a bit of a challenge with them. But there last summer, we had a six week period or six week period there where it was just the robot spraying. Yeah, wow. And they did the whole twelve thousand. Oh, you're hectares. sitting by the beach. No, no. Yeah, I wish. No, we're <laughs> planting crops and doing other things and development work. So building dams. Um, so that allowed us to just they just operated in the background. So they've just seamless integration into the business. It was quite like I think some of the key points from them was, yeah, it was tough getting to know them. Probably take it for granted now having them. Um, teaching everyone to not park vehicles on roads where they're moving around. Mm -hmm. Like at planning, for example, when the robots, we don't, like we use the robots pre-plant now. Do you? They just run in front of the spray, uh, the planet. Yeah. So now we don't even have a machine. We don't even have a spray rig going in front of them anymore. Unless we have a big rainfall event before planning and you've got little weeds coming up, we'll use the big one. Yeah. But like our self-propelled, but like if we've, if we're coming into and we've had decent rain and then we've got two or three weeks spray window before we plant, we'll just hit it again with the robot again, pre-plant. So what we've got, like you saw today, we had three planters, spreader, and then we have three guys on logistics and then you can have the robot, two robots going there in front of them. Whereas if you didn't have the robots. Yeah. yeah. What do you reckon the future is for them on your farm here specifically? Uh, I think it's going to be tough to automate like deep ripping harvesting planning is going to be it's not going to be hard to do but it's going to have its own challenges like even the robots have their own challenges with spraying with like we've got some country that follows the river it's quite tough to get that area with good gps reception most of it's manually steered by a human anyway when mm -hmm. you're there you're not using the gps so it's a bit hard to integrate that there so i don't know i think once this dock and fill comes out where they're allowed to auto fill and can be developed. Like I'd say, you know, I said the slave comment before. Yeah. The robots have come and they've taken the driving time out of the paddock, but what they haven't taken is the mixing time. So now the next ambition is to get this dock and fill so you're, you attend to it on a routinely basis and it doesn't matter what you do, that day still happens. They're not sitting there in the middle of the day in the peak spray wind, like a really good spray window because you're in a you're in the paddock fixing a water trough or you're somewhere where you got you can't leave like a situation like that so the robot just has to wait at the moment yeah. whereas once we implement that dock and fill we're going to be able to run them that extra bit so i'd say your farm's fairly cutting edge i think in terms of management style in terms of the uptake of technology uh for definitely for what i've seen but i just think across the the board what does like the future look like here in say 20 odd years what do you what do you what do you think if you to start to look into the crystal ball of like what's possible in the space of where farming's oh, heading i wouldn't say we're probably i wouldn't say we're cutting edge i'd just say we'd like to adopt things and make sure they work um but i think going forward with the future i think anything's possible with ag tech i think it's a very cool space with from drones through to just the drones are cool what they can do for the livestock i think there's an opportunity brewing with being able to implement wireless fencing with cattle that's coming. I'm pretty keen to have a look at that. But I think the sky's the limit on what's possible. I think it's just going to be making sure that you don't see the autonomous gear as a silver bullet to take all the problems away and take out the actual what farming is. Farming is dedication and hard work and also timing. So you can have all the gear and you want. You can have the flashiest of flashiest everything. And if you don't nail the timing, the guy down the road who has a 10-foot bar that he pulls with his ute that nearly throws the seeds on the ground will do a better job than the multi-million dollar machine if he beats the timing. So the art of farming is still going to be there regardless of what happens. So what makes you passionate about it? Oh, it just it's a, a lifestyle a little bit. I think it's also, I think... It's very satisfying to make decisions and following the result right through. I feel like if I was working in a business within a business that wasn't mine, probably it'd still be quite satisfying, but probably not quite as driven. Like it definitely gets me out of bed every day to make sure like I want to make sure I'm doing this. Like the robots have been a very big indication of wanting to drive them for success because I see it as a really good forward thinking thing for our business. And I wanted to make sure they worked. Yeah. 
because it'd be easy to throw gla- like throw stones in a glass house and say, well, they're not going to work. But I think that I'd like to say they've been like the testament of the robots is the, my dedication with them. And how important is it, do you reckon, to remain optimistic in the f- face of those, bringing in those new things, which can be clunky, but... I think if you're not trying to progress, you're going to get left behind. I think this carbon stuff's going to be extremely scary, but I also think it's a very big opportunity and probably a revolution for the ag sector that's it's coming. We don't know much about it. Three years ago, it wasn't even a conversation, but in the last eight months, it's, it's, like, a co- it's like a coffee table conversation <laughs> now everywhere you go. But I think it's going to be a really good opportunity to revolutionise the industry and actually reward farmers that do the right thing. Like if you're producing clean grain or clean beef or whatever it is, you, I hope the metrics in which that gets put in place is going to be driven to incentivise good practices. What do you find, what, like what are the aspects that you think are, are scary for you at the moment? I think cost, just cost of land. Cost of land's quite scary, I feel like. If you're a first generation farmer now, it's it's going to be quite hard to get a, at scale. Mm-hmm. Um, what about in that carbon? Oh, space? carbon stuff. Yeah, I think scary I th- aspects of carbon. I think the carbon stuff is selling your eggs before you know what, before they've hatched. I think that's a scary aspect of it. I think you've got to be doing the carbon projects and everything's going to be really cool. But I also think you that project you do for a dollar today could be worth five dollars tomorrow. You just, that's what I find mm-hmm. hard to get my head around it. I want to be basically at, as I see it right now, I want to be compliant so I can still do what I want to do, but then hopefully turn that into another revenue stream. So at the moment we've got our grain, we've got our livestock, we've got our cattle and sheep. Mm-hmm. Hopefully the carbon can become another revenue stream to help offset either get a lower interest rate or allow us to get a high premium or get us there. Like on a farm with without getting discounted at the moment, that's the goal. But then hopefully down the track, it becomes another asset to the business. Do you guys have aspirations given, I guess, the diversity in your enterprise mix to move closer to that consumer and own more of that value chain? I think I would love to say yes. Um, and I do would like, like you will say yes, but I feel like just our geographical location makes it quite difficult because he is so big with our operation. You got to be very careful to chase that 5% a few hours away and f- lose focus on the 95% of the business, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Like I think I think there's going to be an opportunity to get that value chain with it, mm-hmm. but I think what COVID has showed us that is it can come crumbling down quite fast if you don't build a solid foundation work. Yeah. And being like a fifth generation, I feel like the foundation has been really well laid out for me. I just don't want to jeopardise what has been done prior to me based on trying to chase something that hasn't done due diligence or due homework on. Is that a big, um, I guess, yeah, does it come with quite a bit of pressure being the fifth gen farmer? Yeah, I, I feel like, I think, well, in, the, in our conversation earlier with um, before, but um, I think the fifth generation pre- presents a very big opportunity that I, it's a ve- I'm very grateful for where I am and how I've gotten here, but I also in turn want to repay the faith that I've got from mum, dad, grandparents, and my great grandfather, who's done all the work to get to where we are. So like the masters was an aspect that I've done, but I, I did that for my own individual, but I also wanted to make sure I was qualified enough to, to jump the business to the next step. So, um, maybe one final question. Um, what's, what's something that you're like, curious, intrigued about, maybe a question you want to throw out into the ether of GRDC listener land. Um, what's something yet you're wondering or trying to work out at the moment? I just feel like for the East coast of Australia, I feel like the lack of knowledge with like, say liquid fertilizers is a big realm of understanding that I wish we were better at, or not just liquid fertilizer, but nutrition, plant nutrition. I feel like there's a lot of good old heads out there that have known a lot of knowledge and I just am concerned that we're not going to be able to replenish them because it's an aging industry, as you know, by all the stats. Like we've got young people like you and I coming through, but I just hope that all that knowledge learnt can be retained and we can grow on it further. Maybe grab that wisdom while it's there. Yeah, because it's pretty important. Like if you could learn how to input your usual inputs in 
the ground and you can save 20%, that's a pretty decent margin if the whole industry as a whole can ask, like do that. I'm not saying it, it might only be half a percent, but half a percent's half a percent. Adds up on the, uh, yeah, across the hectares and across the, yeah. the dollars. Mate, well, Tom, thank you so much for this afternoon. I know I was a little bit late with getting to you, but um, fascinating and, and so cool to see everything from, you know, I just think the different kind of geographies of where you guys are farming within quite a close yeah. area, but also that implementation of tech as well and, and yeah. getting the chance to chat. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. Thank you.